Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is a on-the-road version of the latest Shiny. Uh, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, uh, your host. Uh, Steve Inspector is happily in uh, Idaho. Uh, we are at the uh, Key Bank Emerging Tech Summit in Vail, and uh, it's always a great place to meet the latest industry leaders, talk about some amazing topics. Uh, this year, Edge has been a, a fantastic uh Attention grabber, which is surprising to me because it's not one of those things you think about. And I asked Z Hussein uh, to join me. He and I talked some last year, and then this year we've been going in some edge cut topics. Um, and so I, I thought everybody who was listening would enjoy sort of a, a real deep dive, as usual, on uh, edge and some of the applications for edge that we've been talking about. Am I giving us an introduction? Actually, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for that introduction, there, Rob. I am the CTO and founder of a company called Ares Communications. We're in the IoT space, providing network services and analytics services and data transport services. All of that being for the kinds of customers that need to have a remote data gathering application of some kind, or they want to control some device out in the field. Anything from connected car to medical devices to industrial IoT, etc., uh, home automation, you name it, there's some IoT capability and application that makes sense for us to be supporting our customers, be local enterprise customers, not individuals and consumers. This is one of those cases where we think about Edge coming, but for you it's not. Edge has been around for a while, and you have a huge cell phone presence, or uh, mobile data presence, That's right. I would call it. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, for, for IoT, we've been involved in long-range data transport from the get-go. More than 20-plus years ago at this point, uh, we had customers ranging from the connected car industry, the alarm industry, the fleet management industry, people who need to have a natural mobile solution. And when you have, a, when you have those kinds of markets where the devices are out in the field, cellular is a natural option for them. Or satellite, if they can afford the data rates, uh, the cost of the data rates associated with those transports. So we support the connected car industry very heavily. For example, we're the third largest in the U.S. behind the two giants that are incumbent here. And we su support the fleet industry for from long haul trucking. Uh, people who have a need for data transport where cellular makes sense. That's exactly it. I'm repeating myself a little bit, but that's basically no, the idea. I, and I think it's important for people to understand, you know, as a, we have a tendency to define edge with low latency. and you know, you're really right up, right on the forefront, more from a, edge, a device connectivity. Exactly, and, and you know, if you think in terms of um, the, the edge functionality that's necessary, um, I I don't like to think of the IoT sensors that are out there as being edge devices, even though they're actually at the extreme edge. The reason I don't consider them as being edge computing devices or edge processing devices is they generally don't have the processing power to make it work. They're low cost, very low um, function devices that are making some kind of a measurement. Right. It's that next step where they connect into where either a device is uh, attached to those sensors, those IoT devices, then transmit the data perhaps to a gateway, and then maybe the gateway that transmits it to the cloud or into a, a service like ours where we get the data. So the edge computing, to me, sort of stops at that gateway place, which is where you have the sufficient compute power, sufficient memory, sufficient capability to be able to implement the functionality that an edge computing solution but, but in the current fleets that you're describing, right, they're global, pre they're, they're mm -hmm. let's say just a national presence, there's no gateways for them to aggregate to. Or is well, that, well, is there that is, in a sense there is, and that's exactly, the, it's, it's exactly the, the point I would like to make, which is that, it, to me, a connected car, in a sense, is an edge device. Okay. Um, they have the compute power and, and getting even more powerful as time goes on because of the autonomous vehicle industry requiring a lot of computing capability for processing the data that the sensors provide to them. LiDAR, sonar, radar, all of the things that are vision processing necessary for the EV industry, the car is becoming more and more powerful. And that's a place where you can then start providing functionality, processing of the local data that it receives, filtering, perhaps ignoring bad data, and including the fact that not all the data needs to be transported back into the cloud. So the car becomes a kind of edge device in a sense, a smart edge device. Well, but... So the, the dilemma I have with the car as, as basically an edge data center is it's expensive. It is. It to, is. to put all that processing, to maintain all that software, patch it, update it. Wouldn't we be well served to move some of that or even a fair bit of it off to a, a static data center that's in a oh, sure. regional? Some of it, no doubt. Okay. There, there is no doubt about that. It just depends on what it is that you need to have transported. 
the reason why you want to try and minimize that, not necessarily send all the data, is because the cost of transport in a cellular or a satellite environment is really expensive. Sure. Uh, it's metered. Unlike the typical wireline kind of connections, you have to pay for every kilobyte that's sent. And if you can avoid sending something that is non-critical, then it's better off processed inside the vehicle. Uh, as an example of this, uh, if, if you, there's, a, there's a fleet application uh, that came out some time back driven by a regulation. Uh, a number of years ago, NHTSA, the, the Highway Transportation Safety Guys, uh, determined that about of the 35,000 deaths that were being caused on the highway, a large percentage, a large majority of them maybe even, were being caused by underinflated tires on trucks and trailers that were long haul trucks, sure. 18 wheels. And they set out and, and created a requirement that all of the tire pressures had to be monitored in the morning every day before the driver set out on his usual route. Well, there is an example where automation and then getting the right data sent back makes sense. So, for example, the, the, the uh, automated tire pressure systems, which already exist and the sensors are already out there, were in, in, in brought into the truck, brought into the trailer, and an automated system, typically a, a pad of some kind, usually an iPad or some kind of a, a pad device, would take all the data readings. Sure. Combine it into a um, set of files, basically electronic data logging files, and then transmit that information back to the server. So then keep it locally, but all the formatting, the functionality, the processing of the data to make sure erroneous data was thrown out was processed locally in that in that truck, and then the data was sent back and stored somewhere else. Sure. So there's a there's a there's a separation, if you will, perhaps of the edge computing that was done and the data that was gathered there and what was sent back. So, so what, but what you're just what you're describing to me defies some of the ways we've been thinking about edge, sort of you know in this ne the next gen edge, yeah. if you will, where we're assuming five G is going to show up and putting things in the five G spectrum is going to be super cheap, and we're just going to broadcast and then moving things from that five G concentration point to the cloud is the expensive. Yeah, I, I, one could argue that that's indeed really the case. Okay. When I when I think in terms of the pad, I mean these things are connected into a station a product inside the vehicle that has a cellular connection. Now, whether that's 3G, 4G, or 5G, there's going to be evolution over there. Sure. But the cost per bit in 5G is not necessarily going to be dramatically lower than 4G. Right. Uh, it's, it's just that it all adds up. We had a really interesting uh, discussion, sort of where we went from this point into machine learning. Because if, if what you're saying is true, we need to be thinking about even that first mile or some people say, I guess, the last mile wireless cost. <laughs> yeah. But from the device's side, it's first mile back to some concentration where you're going to aggregate sensors and do all this great sure. IT work. We're not going to send all that data. Yep. Even if even if we wanted to, we need a way to, to prune out what that information totally is. Agree. And so so we had a conversation about that. Can you recap? Well, I, I think the, the point that point is very well taken, is that a lot of the data you gather simply isn't relevant. Uh, it's uh, measuring tire pressure continuously, for example, in that application, or a vending machine where you take the temperature every five minutes. That's not a necessary trans transmission that has to be sent back to process somewhere else. So you do the edge computing. You, you make sure that everything is, is working fine in the device. In that vending machine example, uh, instead of sending the temperature, I will have a configurable uh, setting that says if it goes above a certain temperature, then and then only then should you transmit. Right, etc. So, and that, that's pretty typical, yeah. like factory automation type stuff. Absolutely. But it, is, do we get machine learning into that, mm. where we can actually come in and say, "All right, I've you know 100 sensors in this aggregated aggregated point, and then I can actually make some determination about when the data comes back." It's sure. More than just thresholds. Absolutely. I think machine learning is is going to be key in in making sure that when I say configuration, the temperature setting could be configured remotely, or it could be done manually when it's first installed. Or you could have a whole bunch of parameters that are being gathered on a manufacturing system of some kind where that data has to evolve. You have to modify the parameters under, under which you define when, define when a transmission is sent. So today it might be one value. Tomorrow or three months or six months down the road, it might be a different value. Maybe the average data that's being gathered has shifted. And there's some function that needs to be implemented. That's where machine learning effectively comes into play because... You may want to have a scenario where it's not like you have to open up the channels all the way again, send everything, and make a remote determination. You'll put the, the smarts into the edge computing device so it figures out where the drift has occurred and says, ah, I need to adapt. I need to make the threshold be different. I can easily see a case with this machine learning algorithm where it actually makes decisions to send you a lot of data sometimes to retrain the models. Yes. and Because that's one of the things that's challenging, right? If you're 
using a machine algorithm to prune all the data out, mm -hmm. and your model gets corrupted, exactly. then you have to be able to say, every once in a while, we're going to pull all the data back. Were we talking about an airplane example? There was an airplane example. This is a case where uh, we gather data for a customer. Well, actually, the, the plane itself gathers the data. They transmit the data to us, and we analyze it on their behalf. Uh, we initially started out with a set of conditions under which we would report back a problem, which was input from a subject matter expert or a set of subject matter experts. Well, the subject matter experts generally are very competent at what they do, and they can provide us the guidance necessary to create the rules under which we say, aha, we have a problem, let's make sure, right. let's make sure something is uh, interesting and needs to be reported back to the pilot and the mechanics. The problem occurs when we discover new data that has, basically what you end up with the scenario is that there are patterns that the subject matter experts didn't know about. Sure. Uh, or patterns that they were surprised by. So machine learning is a way of saying, great, I've now learned machine learning perhaps is, is less, of, uh, not as good a term here as data analytics, is a place where you can say, I've found some new patterns, and you go back to the SMEs and say, hey, these new patterns have cropped up. Were you expecting them? Uh, we've had scenarios where the SME kind of reacted with a, hmm, that's unusual, and went back and looked and then decided, yeah, that actually makes sense. We incorporated a new rule. Um, that's where I think the combination of machine learning and proper analytics can give you a better outcome because now you may find new patterns after deployment, after the devices have gone out in the field, after the planes are flying, something new happens and some maybe some new weather condition creates a new, new problem that they hadn't taken into account. And that's where I think the power lies in being able to say, I've got more value in there than just the SMEs. I need to have the capability of learning what could be occurring out in the field and then analyzing it and providing feedback. We tend to, depending on the application, you may want to vet that analysis, meaning that you don't want to arbitrarily take action on something, some new pattern, and create a condition that actually is, is flawed. False positives can be an issue. You have to make sure that you do the right thing. The right thing is not always easy to infer. For listeners, uh, Dave McCrory and I talked about uh, the, the plane scenario differently because uh, he had a data gravity take on it. And I highly recommend go back, listen. Dave's just super smart anyway. Uh, but to check out that if you want an interesting uh, perspective on a very on the same use case, but but from a different perspective. Um, I'm curious, what was that? Can you briefly summarize that? Uh, so, so it it had to do a lot about data gravity, managing the data, auditing how the information was done, and learning, came, getting new insights and inferences from it, mm -hmm. um, and then ingesting it back into a an engine. So. Okay. And he had, some, he had some specifics. I'm trying to remember exactly That's the use fine. cases. That's the basic but, idea, yeah. But yeah. You know, how much you can improve fuel efficiency yeah. and tuning and things like that. So there's it's amazing opportunities. Um, and he he said uh, something similar to what you had said. There's, you know, there's in-flight data, mm -hmm. and then there's on-ground data. Right. And so this idea that I can egress data very quickly when I'm in Wi-Fi zone versus having to make spot decisions in the flight. And that was this was the thing that, to me that you really add in this. It's like the plane's flying. It might be sending small amounts of data based on a machine learning algorithm right. home constantly, but over a very expensive network. Exactly. Lands and then egresses the whole data for relearning. And that's where Dave was really talking about the, the on the ground yeah. piece. That's exactly right. I mean, the data that comes in when the plane lands is comprehensive. It's what the plane gathered in flight for that segment. And then we analyze that in the context of the rules that we design. So one of the things that we also talked about that, that just blew my mind and is, is the lurking specter in every conversation, which is security. So we're in, we're in a situation, I've got a machine learning algorithm that's determining what data comes back and also makes decisions in, in, in situ. That, that's a critical piece of software. It sure is. And it would be possible for me to send an update, critical for me to send an update. Oh, my, my algorithm's wrong. Here's a new one. It'd be possible for somebody to intercept that and send an alternate algorithm? Well, that's a darn good question. I have to admit, I haven't looked at that, mm -hmm. that aspect of uh, what can happen. One thing that is certainly a, a possibility, and, and people worry about this all the time, is the source of data has to be validated. If you've got information coming into your algorithms or the gateways that clearly is outside a certain set of bounds, is it good data or not? Is it truly anomalous data that was gathered during the measurement of that sensor? Or is it somebody injecting false data into mm -hmm. the system? That's a tough problem. Right. Uh, and it's not always clear how you would go about figuring that out. You could end up with a scenario where your filter uh, that you might have in a gateway product says, this data is clearly bad, I'm going to ignore it. But you don't know. 
what happens. It's very dangerous to filter exactly. data, right? That's how we missed the exactly. hole for a long time. There you mm-hmm. go. You, we can miss data that may have actual relevance. Uh, and so you have to occasionally let the machine out and say, you know, I'm getting enough of this bad data that uh, I need to decide whether to send it along and then let somebody else make a judgment call. Uh, human beings perhaps interpret the data and the outcome to say, aha, there's something unusual. Let's go figure out the source. Is it a cyber attack? Is it false data being injected? Uh, is it truly real data that is being measured? Or has my sensor gone out of whack? Things wow. Like that. Right. It's a tough so, problem. Yeah, it's a really hard problem. I mean, where where does that start to occur? I mean, it's clearly a machine learning. We're in sensors. Is that something that we can use aggregated data to solve? Certainly. Uh, I think that's, again, this goes beyond my expertise a little bit. So I will go ahead and frame it in the context. She's being way too modest. No, no well, you know, I don't know enough about this stuff. <laughs> Um, there are algorithms that are in play for making judgment calls as to whether data is an outlier or truly real data that needs to be taken into account in some way, shape, or form. What's missing is perhaps the uh, interpretation of whether that's a security problem or not. There are companies who are trying to get into that. Uh, we're, in fact, talking to a company, and I think they're based out of Virginia, that has a very intelligent algorithm for basically saying, this means it is an attack because they're correlating that data input with similar data input with their other customers. Okay. And that usually is an indication that something is going awry. Uh, they're dealing more in terms of network uh, penetration, network uh, uh, intrusion systems. But the idea is that if they can see it happening in different ways, then uh, you know, different locations, different sites, different customers of theirs, then it's perhaps real. What they don't have experience yet is with IoT. They're doing this on, on the traditional computing systems that a company will, will uh, deploy. They have asked us that they would like to understand what IoT false data could be all about, what hacking could be taking place over there. And so we're trying to work out a partnership arrangement where we'd give them access, anonymized, to our uh, IoT data that they could then use to understand what to look for for other customers. So see a spurious pattern yeah. or see the regular activity. So that brings up one of the other big challenges that we've been identifying over the last two days for the edge industry, which is sharing data. Right. So, right, because the examples you're giving are pretty much a captive system. It is. And yet, what I'd really like to be able to do is correlate. uh, I'll give this the example. This has come up a couple times, but I have an autonomous car driving down the street. I have a a video at the intersection Mm -hmm. watching that autonomous car coming or looking around the corner because it's it sees in other directions and giving that data to the autonomous car right. makes a huge difference in sure. navigability where are we in that's sharing a darn good data? question there are some pros and cons to the issues associated with doing that okay. if you look at what's happening with regards to privacy rules sharing of data becomes very tricky you may have a requirement under the new gdpr so the, the concern that we have about sharing data has to do with the fact that we may have requirements placed on us by our customers to anonymize data to maintain certain kinds of privacy regulations. Um, And indeed, some of the GDPR rules state that you must get rid of the information once the purpose for which that information was gathered or consented to has ceased to exist. If we place that data into a mart or share that with somebody else, then we are no longer in control of what might happen to that data. And that is a concern for us. Now, having said that, there are initiatives in the U.S. where companies who are competitors are providing information so that there is greater good. And security is one of the reasons why they're doing it. So there are these organizations, the Automotive ISAC, the Airplane ISAC, and others, where they're essentially saying, we have had an attack. Here is the information associated with what happened there. We want other people to benefit from our experience of what happened. And that is a open kind of, uh, in a sense, sharing, but not quite mm-hmm. sharing of the raw data itself. And that's yeah. something I think will evolve. I guess for Edge, I'm really thinking that we're going to end up needing a way to share real data that's being collected from sensors that are, that are um, physically in proximity, but data-wise today might be very far apart. Right? Right. They might be running back to different cloud infrastructures. Absolutely. They might be... And so if I want to if I want to improve an experience, I, I'm going to want to take advantage of all the sensors that are in my area. If I'm doing augmented reality, I'm going to want to decorate my environment with, with, with data from these sensors that are coming in. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't feel to me like we, we have any 
even cognition of how we're going to share that information. I think that's exactly right. Uh, the need for it is, is nice. It's clearly there. It's present. I, the, the example that I like to use is that people are putting in these very smart thermostats in a lot of houses, mm -hmm. and they report the temperature back to central facilities in many cases. Uh, the Nest is sort of a canonical mm -hmm. example of a product that's out there, but they're not the only ones. But what if the temperature reading on a set of houses in a particular area could be used to transmit information to the local electric utility that said you should anticipate having to have extra power generation requirements in the next hour or two because temperatures are rising and people are cooling the houses more, etc. One of the examples I heard was that, that you can actually use whether or not windshield wipers are on in cars because the connected cars have that data exactly. to, to provide weather, weather information exactly and right. precipitation exactly data. Right. You know, one of the things that all kinds of little fascinating applications like that could exist where sensor data has value. Right. The problem is value to whom and who's willing to pay for it. And the source of the data is rarely participating in that money chain. You know, it, it does the owner of the car get uh, some kind of a benefit from that? It may just be that the benefit of providing weather information to them is sufficient, but they don't really get a financial incentive to participate in this data transport and marketing and sharing, if you will. It, if that could be solved, I think you would see an explosion. I, I agree with you. It's, it's a commercial driver in figuring this out. We'll, we'll, we'll get people sharing data. If it means sharing the data generates re revenue for them. In some way. And that, that's or means, benefit. It doesn't have to be a financial benefit. It could be some other okay. kind of benefit. It, you know, if it's small enough data uh, and you would get a few pennies per month, who might care? But if you get a benefit of getting some information back, then you would volunteer more of your information into that. It, but even pennies in aggregate yeah, no. could make a big, big difference. You, you had said something interesting about pennies in one of our other conversations about how billing for pennies is a problem. Yes. Um, and that cell phone carriers who have, you know, basically these pervasive devices and they're generating, you know, a couple of cents worth of traffic, it's very hard for them to it do is. that in a, in a realistic way. Definitely. If you look at the industry from a cell phone company's perspective, uh, smartphones generate a significant amount of average revenue per unit per month, uh, ARPU, uh, somewhere in the 40 to 50 to $60 range per month. They can afford to have billing systems be provided to them for a larger amount than you might expect in the IoT space, the sensor space, where typically the numbers are a lot lower than $50 a month. It's down into the, in some cases, fractions of a dollar. So if you end up having to pay a large portion of that towards a billing engine or some kind of billing as a service, you actually lose money because that becomes a major cost of your, your your system. As a result, we did our own billing system because we couldn't afford to provide that kind of cost problems for ourselves, create that kind of cost problem for ourselves. So we did our own billing engine. Interesting to think about it from that perspective. Until we really have good data aggregation and sharing platforms, building your building your own might be actually more expensive than the value you would get from it. And then the same might be true from the aggregation system. Yep. If they're taking too big of a cut from that, that data sharing, yeah. it could become unattractive to share. So the economics of these have to be models. Worked out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, about that. The ROI calculations in the IoT industry are, are something that I think people have to do before they implement a solution, whether it's the application itself or the edge transport or the systems that deal with the processing of the data locally. Well, I'm sure it's obvious to the listeners that this is a splendid application for blockchain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it can be. No, uh, that's totally <laughs> tongue in cheek. It might be. No, it, it actually might be that we can, we can, we can translate my, that. Uh, I'll tell you my opinion here. No, <laughs> I didn't. Be opinion. No, no, it's great. I'll give you a little <laughs> bit of opinion. Why you're taking that question seriously? Uh, no, no, it's, it's serious from the following perspective. People who implement blockchain understand that transaction logging makes a lot of sense. And accuracy of transaction logging makes a lot of sense. But somebody who goes out there and blindly says, I'm going to transaction log every IoT data transport event that takes place is just fooling themselves because the chain will grow so quickly, so rapidly, it will be impossible uh, to deal with. You know, in our network, for example, with the, the seven figures of devices that we have out there, we're processing over 2 billion messages a day. Imagine a lot of putting that into a blockchain. It's just not going to happen. Right? It, it's unrealistic to expect, expect that any of the blockchain technologies could allow the complete transaction history of a device that may stay on the network for 10 years to be logged in that manner. It's just not going to happen. Now, do you, do you log the event itself, the data itself? No, you might want to log violation events, security events. Okay. That makes sense for a blockchain implementation. Hey, this security event took place. I want to log that. And I want to log it securely and put it somewhere so 
that I can see historical data of okay. what attempts have been made. There, that's I think it makes a lot of sense. So what you do with it, <laughs> to be careful. Yeah, it makes sense. And it could be that that might be a way to do build chain of trust yeah. on the authenticity of the system. There you go. You know, there's, there could be a lot of different components for that. Definitely. Um, okay. Wow. We actually <laughs> legitimately talked blockchain. <laughs> Um, and I, actually, I'm going to be talking to Val next, yeah, and so we'll, we'll we'll go way deep into uh, blockchain good. evangelism. I'd love to listen to that podcast. <laughs> Are you really sitting? This is the thing that, that really jumps out to me is that you you, you have this edge experience, right? You, you've done it in a way where it's it's much more accessible than people realize because because you you've, you've gotten a sensor, you have a network, you're aggregating the data back, it's, but it's vertically integrated. Yes, it's a very definitely vertically integrated because. Uh, in, in many cases, the devices that are out there that are transmitting this information may not have a gateway where you can implement edge functions, computing functions, or filtering functions, and those you bring back into the cloud, and then you deal with the, with the data in the cloud. But if you have the ability, particularly when you have very low-cost sensors that are being deployed potentially in the billions in the next decade or so, you're going to need to have the ability, uh, the, the strong ability to be able to do the edge computing functions so that you don't overwhelm the servers and system. Bottom so line. this is there, there's an interesting uh, extension from here because I feel like we're on the, the cusp of a, of a device edge device explosion. How what is the ROI for adding devices into the edge infrastructure? Ah, that's a darn good question, and I don't think I have enough of a good answer okay. to be able to really tackle that. Is there a Jevons paradox event that mm. could happen where all of a sudden you're like? Today we have three sensors on a truck, but we're going to have a hundred sensors on the truck and yeah. video too, and and we're going to sell that video data because we're going to be able to track the license plates of the cars that are passing us. So. I don't think it has been thought through that well. Okay, yet. at least I certainly have, and I know our customers are just focused on getting the basic job done. Okay, features are being added. So, as an example, uh, we have a connected car application that we deployed last fall, where. Um, the car sends a set of diagnostic information back and a set of control requirements from the owner of the car back into the vehicle. The first application control mechanism was a telephone, a cellular phone, that allows them to do certain functions. Well, it's a natural to add voice command to that. Okay. And so you can imagine new interfaces being provided that are either Alexa-enabled or Google Voice-enabled in some way, shape, or form that they can now talk to the device and have certain functions happen in the, in the connected car. Does that mean edge computing has to occur? Sure, it's a combination. You can process some of the information locally. And in the case of doing the voice command interpretation, it all often goes back into the cloud. The systems that are being worked on have that requirement in there. So I think that's an area where some new capability is going to get deployed. But I haven't really thought through a sort of a massive shift makes edge computing an absolute necessity rather than a nice thing. Yeah, I guess I keep, I keep seeing... In, in the in the scenarios we talk about, there's a multiplicative effect. Hey, I have two different sensor systems. I put them together. I get something better. Yeah. Or I've changed the cost economics of collecting data, and all of a sudden, you know, or maybe I'm already paying for that that network device. I could add in more things, and it sure. doesn't really increase the value. It does happen. Okay. When you have a transport, when you have sensors out there, uh, clear, clear examples of this would be like in the automotive space, the cars do have a lot of sensors. The question is, what sensors do you believe are necessary to be uh, analyzed together with other data, perhaps not just from that car, but outside right. the domain of that vehicle as well? And then there are the other sensors that are unique, that have to be manufactured, new designed and, and manufactured. For the um, medical industry, where the sensor technologies are undergoing a tremendous revolution, mainly because some of the things they're trying to measure, they don't really know how to do it yet, but they're getting there. Uh, skin sensors, implanted skin sensors. Uh, uh, we have smart watches. We hardly smart even need to watches, do that yet. Exactly. Uh, all kinds going, of stuff right. is. Well, there, there are even better examples of that. There's this academic research project where the gentleman is developing a sensor a, 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 for transmitting pressure from inside the eyeball. To make predictive decisions about cataracts being developed down the road okay. in the future, and this gets implanted inside the eyeball. It's like, oh, good grief! That's pretty interesting. That's wow! It's a heck of an interesting concept. I don't know how far along they are, but it's an example of where that data might be useful for for um, corrective surgery needs. So that they can determine the focus of the eyeball is no longer where it needs to be. For example, things like that. I'm just imagining. No, I, no, I, I can imagine that you. 
I was thinking through from the watch angle, mm-hmm. right, you could actually start doing sentiment analysis on anxiety in, in situations sure. and say, oh, wait, there's some situation developing because everybody here is, is, is afraid or yeah. everybody's, and you know, their heart rates have risen. And, something wrong. and you could aggregate yeah, data back across that or sure. people are getting angry because they're, the lines are, you know. <laughs> um, With one caveat, which is that we have to be careful about human privacy issues. So that's the big deal. And so it could be that machine learning can help us ag- disaggregate um, yeah, the privacy, privacy data and things like that. But those are those are really sticky problems. And maybe one of the Achilles heels in any edge conversation for now is fundamentally we're collecting information about people in the environment. That's it's true. easy when it's a truck because it's you own the truck. You know the driver's an it's employee. About, it's consented in a sense. Yeah, and then but if you were collecting video streams from intersections. You're going to be capturing pedestrians walking through the intersections right. and all sorts of other things, and so, I mean, maybe we're going to have AIs that'll blur out people's faces, like uh, Google, you know, Google like Maps Google does. does. Yeah, exactly. I think that'll be necessary. Yeah. Uh, human privacy is becoming a big deal, and I mean, obviously, the GDPR rules in Europe are are, are a clear indicator of that, and other countries are following suit. The U.S. is looking at legislation where human privacy is going to become an important thing, and uh, citizen privacy of the people here in the country. And that is something we need to accommodate. I mean, I have no problems with that. I think it makes sense to do. Um, On the other hand, I think there are two things that we need to think through. One is that for the greater good, we may want to to aggregate data, de-identify and aggregate data. And if we have a knee-jerk reaction to say all data for individuals should be wiped out, then I think we need to be looking at really what the purpose behind that is. The second problem, uh, which I think is equally more important, is that when you gather this human data and create these um, de-identified, aggregated pieces of information that you haven't accidentally left in some capability of removing that de-identification because that's a piece of right. techniques can be applied and then identifying a specific individual where that data came from. So we have to be very careful about that. And this is all sort of breaking new ground in many areas in some ways. I, I think it's going to be very hard and to do. I mean, in some cases, I, just walking around with your phone, you, know, you you might anonymize every photo around, but you might be able to have a voice print from a phone where somebody somebody walking next to somebody can then actually trick, place you. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. we're... I, it's a tough problem. It's, it's going to be a very hard problem because there's there's it might just become an impossible problem and we need to solve it not by obscuring information, but by protecting people. Right. So let me give it's you a, much a very topic. hypothetical, this is an yeah. extremely hypothetical example and speaking about things that I probably don't have any, any experience about. EV this systems. podcasts are all bad. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> EV systems and vehicles incorporate vision and processing vision and recognizing the presence of a human being who might have stepped in front of the car. Right. Well, if you de-identify that to the point where the facial recognition perhaps removes the identity of the individual, are you creating a scenario where the algorithms have to be so much smarter to say, ah, that's a human being and not a dog, <coughs> or not a cat? Now, uh, you still don't want to run over dogs and cats, obviously, but at the same time, the liability and the human suffering that could occur if you ran over a human, a human as opposed to a dog or, or something else is different, and right. we have to understand and acknowledge that. So I'm just concerned about that. It's an interesting yeah. because the, the collecting that data yeah. creates identifiable information there about people, and so yeah, and you don't want to you don't want to be like ah oh, the the algorithm was too busy scrubbing the person's identity to actually take a, take a step. What's what's exciting about the edge is is that we have both these platform technology networking conversations, and they they also seem to drift very very easily into security identity and personalization because edge is this exciting place. Right. Where we truly are interacting with humans and environments, um, and so that's a really good thing. I know um, my, my internal Stephen is a uh, producer is, is giving me the it's time to wrap it up. Okay, but your a book is coming out, and I want to get out. a chance to tell people more about that and, and where to find you. This will be very quick. If you go to our website www.aeris.com, you will see a link there for the current edition, which is the second edition of the book. And within a matter of days, uh, a new edition is going to be coming out. That'll be that'll be already come out. By the it'll time already come out by the time this podcast is out there. So please feel free to go and look. It's free. You can download the PDF. Uh, you don't have to buy it. And the idea is that it gives you a broad swath of what's possible for business IoT purposes. It's called a definitive guide to IoT for businesses. Wow. What do you do uh, to implement a new application? How do you start? What's your ROI? What are the use cases that you need to think through? 
what are the things you need to worry about? Uh, devices that are being deployed in the IoT in markets today have a tendency to be very dumb in some ways, where if they can't connect to a network, they retry and retry and retry. Well, it might be a fault in the device, and now you're hammering the network unexpectedly. Right. So you need to think through a lots of problems that can arise when you're deploying an IoT application. And that's what this is trying to do. It's not a negative book saying, don't do this, don't do that. It's more of a try to do this, think about these issues, and go from there. Battle scars are important. Yeah, IoT is hard. It's, it, it is really hard. hard. And we've got 20 plus years of experience with developing and our customers developing and us helping them deploy those applications. And this is sort of a distillation of how those learnings have come about. So go through it if you're interested in IoT. And where can they find you if they have questions? Absolutely. So I'm on the I'm on the website. Uh, my email address is very simple. Okay. My first name dot last name at eris.net and you can reach me. Okay. Excellent. Z, Thank I appreciate the time. This has been a fun conversation. Absolutely. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. My pleasure.